Good morning. Hope everybody's doing great. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Um, excited to preach this morning and talk to you guys a little bit about seeking God some more and um, getting into His Word. And, and so let's pray and uh, we'll jump into some worship and then we'll come back, get into the Word. God, we uh, thank you for your Word. Thank you for your time. Thank you that we can worship you. Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, grateful for the name of Jesus that allows us to enter into your presence, into your throne room. We just pray for your grace this morning, that you would wash over us and cleanse us of every stain and evil thing that hinders us from being holy and close to you. And God, that you'd make us righteous and that we would be able to enter the throne room, the very presence, your presence, come close to you. And would you come close to us as we seek your face this morning? God, we love you so much, and we worship you. We give you all the honor and all the glory, all the praise. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and worship this morning. Father, we worship you this morning. Our prayer is that you be glorified and magnified. You're so worthy of our praise. We love you, Lord. And Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we're just so grateful and thankful for how wonderful you are, how faithful you are. Our prayer is that you would open our eyes to see you as how you really are, high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. There is no one who's like you. And Father, we repent for not seeing you that way all the time, Lord. We're making you too small, God. There's no one who's like you. You are worthy of our praise. We honor you and we glorify you this morning. Let's just start as we sing, just to lift our voice to the Lord. Sing to you.
God, thank you for the time to worship you. Thank you that we can lift our voice to you. Thank you that you hear us and hear our cry. Thank you that you help us in our time of need. Thank you that you love us um, in a way that is pretty much unexplainable and um, impossible, and yet you do it. We uh, pray that we would be pleasing to you in every way. Let your word just fill our hearts today. Let your word change us and mold us into the image of Jesus. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Hey, good to be with you. Um, hope you had a great Thanksgiving and uh, got to get your fill of pumpkin pie and apple pie and turkey and whatever else you guys had. And I hope you got to spend some time with some family and friends. And man, what a weird year. A weird year for all kinds of holidays and things but you know Thanksgiving being a time where we would normally gather around tables I hope you were able to do that I hope you got some time with your family and uh, you are blessed um, I'm excited to talk this morning um, I'm gonna get a little cliche on you and we're gonna discuss uh, the topic of the bread of life um, Jesus uh, is mentioned as the bread of life we we read throughout scripture from Old Testament to New Testament about bread and um, you know, the, the Bible, even Jesus, when he was uh, teaching his disciples how to pray, said, give us this day our daily bread, right? But bread represents so much, and bre bread is in Scripture so much. Uh, and just seeing as it was Thanksgiving, and we're talking about food and everything else, I thought it'd be a fun thing to jump in and dive into understanding. Now, I want to do this in the context of what we've been talking about, seeking God. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We're going to be in verse 53 um, for now, but then we're going to back up and go to, to verse 1. So we'll start at 53, and then we're going to back up and kind of dig into the meat of this. Here we go. John 6, 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, <clears throat> and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. God, thank you again for your word. Help us to understand even these tough sayings that Jesus mentioned in scripture. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, what an intense scripture, right? Um, what an intense saying. Could you imagine living in that time and the preacher stands up before the crowd and we're talking like this is a mega church uh, that at that time because he's got thousands of people following him and there's a lot of people overhearing this conversation and the preacher looks at everybody and says hey unless you participate in what they perceive to be cannibalism then you're gonna have a problem in this faith right if you you need to eat my flesh he says and you need to drink my blood he says and the Bible says that this is just too much for a lot of them. A lot of the disciples, it was just too much for them to grab hold of and understand what Jesus was trying to say. The thing is, though, is this is not where Jesus started. He kind of led up to this. Um, and we'll get into that. But could you imagine being the disciples? I have this picture in my mind. Of course, this isn't Bible. It's just something I like to think of of how the, the, the disciples are um, listening to Jesus as he's teaching. And they've got all these people following him, and they're making this massive impact in the society and the community that they're living in and everything else. And then Jesus goes and says this, and I can imagine they're sitting there looking at each other like, what is he talking about? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. <laughs> well, what is he saying, right? And I almost wonder if, like, the after party, if you want to call it that, where they get to gather for dinner and it's just them and they're hanging out. 
and they're sitting there among each other and they're kind of talking quietly almost arguing like who's going to be the one to ask him what in the world was he thinking when he said eat my flesh and drink my blood right and you kind of get this picture that like it's probably peter who finally gets the strength and the boldness to come out and go um hey jesus can we address the elephant in the room about this uh idea that you brought to the table in front of thousands of people of eating your flesh and drinking your blood you know and uh it's just intense it it, it was an a, an interesting and uh, intense thing for him to say and um the thing that we need to understand though is he didn't start there he kind of built up to this saying so it, his starting words were more along the lines of eating bread right and then he begins to start talking about what is the bread and then how to eat the bread but here at the end he's talking like hey eat my flesh drink my blood so we're gonna dig in a little bit see what was he talking about why did he say this um, but mostly in context of seeking him and understanding what all this means so um, it doesn't start with this it, it, it starts this storyline starts and this conversation starts with the famous um, story and account of Jesus feeding 5,000. So let's read that, and then we'll continue on to see exactly what Jesus was trying to say. John 6, same chapter, but verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were deceased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread, that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down, in number about five thousand, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and to the disciples to those who were sitting down, and likewise of the fish, and as much as they wanted. So then, when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragment, fragments of the five barley loaves and, that were left over by those who had eaten. And then those men, when they had seen the sign Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. So Jesus famously takes the, the, the loaves and the bread, and he feeds all of these people, right? Um, and he gives enough for all of them to eat to their fill, and then he has 12, coincidentally, probably not, uh, baskets, the number of the disciples, uh, left over and so they have this abundance left over after doing the work of the distribution of the food to the people then john six fifteen says this and this is where we want to kind of jump into the meat of where i want to go today therefore when jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king he departed again to the mountain by himself alone think about that he feeds this, this large mass of people who are all in town for the Passover. And he perceives that they're going to forcefully now make him their king. And so he does what? He departs. Because his desire is not to become their natural, material king. Um, they're looking at Jesus and they're going, Man, this guy can feed thousands of people with just a little plate. This guy can heal the sick. This guy can calm storms. 
he, this is the king that we want in our place. Why? Not because of who he is, but because of what he does for them. And so they're looking at him going, man, this guy makes food out of nothing and he does all these great things. We want him to be our king because we hardly have to do anything at that point. He's just going to make everything materialize. And so for them, it's a blessing and a benefit in the material and the natural for him to be king because of what he does for them. Now, the next part of the story, the disciples, they jump in a boat and they, and Jesus sends them across the water and Jesus departs and he goes to be by himself to pray for a little bit. Um, now, the storm arises during this time and we get another famous story here where the storm is, is tossing them to and fro and they're scared and, and Jesus comes to them um, and walking on water and it says that he says, hey, it's me, I'm here, don't be worried. And then it says immediately, they're at the other side. And then in John 6, 24, we see what happens next. So now the disciples and Jesus ha have just ran basically departed from the crowds of people because they want to make him their natural king for what they do for him. And they have now crossed the water and they're on the other side. But in 6, 24, it says the people, they, they weren't okay with that, right? So here's what happens. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Right? They're like, hey, how did you get here? We, we saw them get in the boat. <clears throat> we saw them go to the other side. And then we got in boats and we came to the other side. But we never saw you come in the boat. How did you get over here? Right? And then this is what Jesus says to them. He says in verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not. That's my first point this morning. You seek me not. You seek me not because of the saw you saw the signs, but because you are because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So what does Jesus say? Jesus, All these people, these thousands of people, they come looking for him. They're following him wherever he goes. They probably have been for a little while now. He's just fed them and provided for their material and their natural needs. And so they follow him and they chase him down. And they're like, hey, how did you get over here? And he goes, look, you're, you seek me, but you don't seek me because of the, you saw the signs. He's saying, you, um, you don't seek me because of what the miracle represented. You don't seek me because I'm the miracle maker, but you seek the miracle. You seek what I do for you. He's saying you don't seek the signs that point to the destination, right? That's what signs do. When you're driving down the road, you look at signs, why? Because they guide you to the destination. The sign is not the thing that should be worshiped. The sign is not the thing that should be desired and sought after. But the destination is the thing that is sought after. Well, Jesus is the destination. But he's saying to them, look, you don't seek me because of those. You seek me because of the outcome. You seek me because I'm useful to provide dinner plates. You seek me because um, I'm useful in the midst of your Roman oppression. Uh, you seek me because I'm useful for paying taxes by pulling coins out of fish's mouths uh, when the taxes get hiked, right? Um, and he says, you're laboring in vain because you're laboring for the wrong thing. You're laboring for the sign, the material comfort. You're not laboring for the right thing. Um, and it's not that he's not concerned about their natural needs because the Bible is very clear that he meets our needs, that he gives us more than enough, that he provides an abundant life, that he understands that we need shelter and food and, and these things. Um, and he says he'll take care of those things for us. He'll provide those things for us. But he says to seek first the, the, the kingdom and all its righteousness, right? So these people are seeking the sign. They want the, the result of an earthly king in their time. Now, Jesus cares about that. And he's concerned about that. Stuff because it was him that pointed out, Jesus was the one who pointed out, hey, these thousands of people seeking after, they're hungry. We got to provide some food for them. And then he uses that to ask the disciples, hey, how are we going to do this? Right? And they're like, we, if we had 200 denarii, we couldn't do it. If we had 200 days worth of wages, we couldn't do it. And Jesus it says, the Bible says, 
use this to, to teach them. Um, but he's the one who was concerned about their needs. He's the one who's concerned about those who were demonically oppressed, who were sick, who were hurt, who were caught in boats in the storms. So he cares about our natural needs. And these are things that he certainly provides and takes care of. However, in this time, he's trying to get them to realize something. Hey, the bread that you seek is the wrong bread. And so they say, well, um, he says to them, you're laboring after food that perishes, materialistic and natural things. Um, don't labor for that food. Uh, labor for the food that endures. And basically, he's trying to say and teach them to think not in terms of physical and material, but in spiritual. But they're still not getting it because they're, they're, they're asking the wrong questions. Look what they say um, in John chapter 6, verse 28, as they're still continuing this conversation. They said, so what should we do and that we may work the works of God? See, Jesus said, remember Jesus said, you labor for food that perishes. And so they're still not getting it because their attention is drawn directly and straight to works. The first thing to think is, well, then what work of God should we do? What labor should we do? And he's, he's like, how do I get you to understand? I'm not talking to you about the labor, though that's a part of it and he's going to address it. I'm trying to get you to understand the bread. But they're not asking about the bread. They're asking about, well, what works can we do? And probably somewhat a little bit in their pride because they're proud of the works that they do. They've been righteous in their own eyes. In John 6, 29, Jesus answers them and he says this, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. That's it. Just believe in him. Believe that he is the bread of life. Believe that he is the provider of uh, satisfaction in him and him alone. Um, believe that he's not just uh, useful for the treasure, but that he is the treasure himself. Be more concerned about asking about what or who the bread is than you are about the labor that must be done. He's trying to get them to understand this. Um, now, you can't blame them. I mean, you can blame them, but, but to, to just kind of think in, in their shoes for a minute, They've been laboring their whole lives, and all their ancestors has been doing the same. If you think all the way back to Adam and Eve, in Genesis chapter 1, after Adam and Eve's sin, God says to Adam, Here, here's the result, Adam, and I'm quoting from Genesis 1.19. He says, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. So they've understood that they have to labor and sweat and earn the bread. And that was the material food and also had spiritual meaning and implications. So they had to sweat to eat bread and they had to sweat to offer sacrifices for sin, the provision for their spiritual health, right? Now Jesus comes along and he feeds these thousands of people. He does the labor. He does the They just sit and he does the miracle. He does the labor. He provides for their material need. But he also provides for their sacrificial need in becoming that sacrifice once for all. So Jesus is, and the Bible, without getting too deep into this, the Bible talks about the first Adam and the second Adam and what the provision of Jesus is. But these guys are still caught up thinking about, well, the works that we have to do and etc. Well, that for their whole life and for generations, there's been works that needed to be done in order to get bread from the ground and to get bread for the, sac for the spiritual health. Um, and Jesus comes to say, hey, look, I actually can provide all those things. But the most important thing I'm trying to get you to understand is that I am here as the spiritual bread. So then in John um, 6.30, he says, therefore, they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? As if 5, 000, feeding 5,000 wasn't enough, right? What work will you do? 
Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. Now, isn't that a fr- oh, when I hear that, it's frustrating because they're like, hey, look, Moses produced manna in the desert. So you feeding the 5,000 is great. It's cool. But we've seen it before. That's kind of like the, the inclination. That's kind of what I get from what they're saying here. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so Jesus corrects them. He says, assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Now Jesus obviously is talking about himself. They're still confused. Manna, bread, material, earthly, you know, and Jesus is trying to just get them to see. And each time he talks, he mentions a little more straightforward and intense that he is the bread and what that means. Because he's talking about bread, bread of life, bread from heaven. And now he's going to start getting a little bit more plain in his language and then pretty spiritual and intense in his language. Because he says this, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So he finally just comes out and says it. Look, I'm the bread. You got to seek nothing but me. If you come to me, you'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. I'm the one who the signs point to. I'm the provision from heaven. Um, You seek bread that is useful to you materially and worldly, like cars and money and fame and politics and whatever. But I'm the heavenly bread that is good for in eternal, internal satisfaction. So then we go on to verse 41. So the Jews then complained about him. So he gives them, he literally gives them the answer. He, he's trying to explain and say, they're asking the question. He's finally openly and more plainly giving the answer. And they start complaining about him. Because he said, this is what it says, Because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? (laughs) So he gives them exactly what they want. But here's what I get from that passage. We often seek Jesus for how he is useful to our liking. Rather than useful to his liking. And that's what they're doing. They're seeking Jesus for how he is useful to their liking rather than to his liking. So then in verse 48, he says this, and here he is again. Jesus is just getting more to the point, more intense, leading up to the scripture that we started off with. He says, I'm the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they're dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Whoa. If if anyone eats of this bread, which is my flesh. So now he's practically almost saying what we just originally read for our main scripture. And he says, if you eat this bread... I shall give for the life, uh, he says, I'm going to give this bread, this flesh, for the life of the world. So he's getting stronger in his language. Verse 52, the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Still, caught up in what does Jesus do for us naturally, worldly, here, physically, materially. Then it says, Um, many of his followers left that day because they couldn't handle it. They couldn't grasp it. They couldn't um, wrap their minds around what Jesus was trying to say. And the things he was saying were too intense. John 6, 60 through 64. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? So when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? 
What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Now he's trying to kind of like tie this together. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. So he's trying to say, when he says, does this offend you? He says, um, it is the spirit who gives life. The, the flesh, it profits nothing. And he's trying to get them to understand, I'm speaking to you with spiritual min- meaning. These words that I speak to you are spirit. He said, I'm the bread. I'm the treasure. Seek me, not what I am useful for or the sign or the material thing, but seek me. And this is spiritual meaning, spiritual talk that I'm giving to you is what he's saying. So Jesus had satisfied their natural hunger through the miracle of feeding the 5,000. Now he was trying to help them understand that that is secondary to the primary, which is that he can satisfy their spiritual hunger. And he's trying to say, look, the flesh is the flesh, but the spirit is the spirit. And the best way I can explain this and kind of understand this is, if you've lived at all, you know that the satisfactions of the material things in life become dull quickly. They're not eternally satisfying. Let me give you some examples. Do you remember playing with toys when you were a kid and then coming to the realization that toys were not as fun? And now, what is it that I'm going to pick up that are fun? Do you remember getting to the point where you were 16, 17, maybe you were in your 20s, whatever it was, when you wanted your first car and you wanted to drive? And having a car for the first time was exciting and fun, but then it becomes dull, expensive even, right? How about when you landed your first job or a better job? And for those first few weeks and even months, maybe it's exciting, it's fun, it's good. And then it becomes what? (laughs) Work. Or how about buying your first house or renting your first house? Just having your first home in general. Those things are fun. They're exciting. They feel good for a moment. But it's fleeting. And Jesus is trying to say to them, Look, the satisfaction is not coming from the sign itself, but from the sign, from what the signs point to. It's not from the, the, the manifestation of the materialization of the miracle. But the satisfaction comes from the miracle maker himself. And so this is where he gets into these words. He says, look, finally, after saying bread of life, okay, you're going to have to eat of the bread, which I am the bread. Now, finally, he starts saying, you got to eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. And these people's eyes are big. Like, what is he saying, right? And he says, when you do, you will have spiritual satisfaction. And here's the results of that in verse 52 through 58. The results of this spiritual satisfaction are abundance of life. Jesus said, I'll give you life and life more abundant. But we're not talking about the kind that the world would provide. We're talking about what he's saying, which is spirit. He says, I'll give you eternal life. He says, I'll give you true, not false life satisfaction and he'll provide supernatural companionship and fellowship verses 52 through 58 a summary of some of the results and the beautiful things that come when we begin to partake of the true bread of life which is this real genuine relationship personal seeking jesus not the sign Seeking not what we get out of him or from him, but him himself as the treasure. So what does all this mean? How do we wrap this up? Well, I believe the challenge and even the challenge for the disciples at the time 
is to begin to see Jesus in and of himself as the satisfaction of life. There's much that comes from this relationship with him, even the things that I just listed off, abundance of life, eternal life, true satisfaction, supernatural companionship and fellowship are all blessings and benefits of seeking him first. And I believe that in these times, we're to seek him. In these times of being maybe secluded, isolated, restricted through COVID and the different things that are going on, I've been saying this for weeks, but I believe it so intensely that we need to be a church who understands the beautiful blessing that we have in our ability to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And so when we labor, as he said to, the, to those who were to the Jews that were around at the time, our labor is not in obtaining the signs or the material. Our labor is in obtaining a relationship with him. So long for, seek for, strive for this relationship, to know him, to see his face, to hear his voice, to spend time in his presence, to worship him. That's what I believe is for us. That's what I think Jesus, what God wants for his people in today's world. Let's pray. God, we seek you and you alone first. We pursue you. We push after. We push through the clutter, the things that get in the way, the distractions. We see past the material and the things that promise satisfaction that can't provide it. And we look to you. And God, I ask one simple thing as we close today. Would you please reveal yourself to each and every one of us? May we see your glory. Even as Moses said, show me your glory. I want to see your face. I want to, be, I want to talk to you in the tent. I want to speak to you face to face. God, let us understand that. Would you become our best friend? Would you become our place of satisfaction? The relationship that we go to, our go-to place. But Lord, let us not be restricted. Let us hear your voice. Let us see your face. Let us feel your nearness to each and every one of us. We long for your presence and to be close to you. And we love you so much. We thank you that you invite us into this relationship. And that you said when we seek, we will find. When we knock, the door will be open to us. And so we seek you in these days to come. And we knock today saying, open up, Lord, so that we can be close to you. We love you. I'm so grateful for your love and your goodness. Be with us all. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you. We will see you all really soon, and uh, have a fantastic week. Take care.